All right. Let me just let me just start this up and then um, it's showing the speaker notes right now, right? No. No. Oh, what do you what do you see? Do you see this the PowerPoint? Yep. Yeah, there's a little on the bottom. It's got the little one of fifteen, so you can like where you could advance the slides with a little arrow. Yep. Um, so I don't know if that's what like the primary page is supposed to look like, but there's no oh, notes. I can do that. Really? Can, can you move it forward, Elaine? Yeah. Yeah, so could I. Oh. I can do a lot of stuff I shouldn't be able to do. I can go to grid view. I won't. Interesting. OK. Yes. Interesting. Do you see oh, the speaker a... note? Do you see the speaker notes, Elaine? No. And nor do we want to, right? No, right. we don't. So for me, like, is this going through? Now are we in page three? Yep. All right. So I'm. Oh no, I'm this. still. I'm still on page one. I saw. I saw the flipping. So now it's two. I'm not that seeing make, that. That doesn't make sense. How come I can see it and you can't? Oh, it says live presenter slide three, but it's not viewing it that way. I'm viewing it. Oh, now. OK, OK, I got I clicked on. So if you touch anything, you are in control. And then there's a little box on there saying where the presenters has put the slide. Oh. So I clicked on that. So Dave controls what everybody sees. You kind of accidentally put yourself on the wrong page. So yeah, don't so mess I with it. Right, so I can shift around, but then that little box pops was at the bottom saying it was in red that Dave the presenter is on slide uh -huh. three. And so when I clicked on that box, it took me where you were. Right, so I I just clicked on to slide four and it, I can click that red box and it goes back to where the presentation is. Yeah, so you can go back and forth looking. But so if, go back if I wanted, yeah, if I wanted to see what slides next, I could do that and then click that red box to go back to live. Yeah, that's or a nice you feature actually once you learn it. Yeah, but, and especially if you are taking notes and they advanced it, you want to quick go back to the previous slide to finish taking notes. <laughs> Interesting. All right, so I'm, I'm telling you what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing a red box around the slides, and I'm seeing um, the presenter notes and the slides. You know, so like I can see welcome to the workshop for scoring process for the regional solicitation. Okay. I'm Elaine Katsukos. So what, what I'm thinking, Elaine, is if you start sharing this, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit sharing. No, what you actually you do this since you can see the notes. That's what I was typing up the script is so that you could forward through it when I finish talking. Okay. So if you can see that we don't. All right. So but that's again, this is on Teams. It'll be right. interesting to see what the recording looks like, though. Hopefully, that, if that doesn't show the yeah. notes, it's good. Yeah, well, let, let's just let's just go through the 15 slides. And then um, then I'll stop the recording, and then I'll open it up the recording and see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. and this, and this is good. That's the one we upload online, too. Right, right, exactly. Say what? Is that test Joe or what? Yeah, I was asking I would know. what you meant when you said what's the one we upload online? I missed. So if we record this one and it's very good, this is the oh recording so, we'll put up online. And then a live show might just be a live show. Right. So do we not want the Q and A posted? Is that maybe we don't need to do this while recording? Well, we'll record it. We'll record it so we can put it up there if there's something that's really good that comes out of it, but we don't have to. Okay. Right, we'll see, because if they're asking this way, if they want to ask questions throughout the presentation, they can do that. But we don't have to put those up online either. I mean, we can decide that after the fact. Right. To me, it's just getting something up and. <laughs> OK, I can start. OK. Thank you. 
Welcome to the workshop on the scoring process for the regional solicitation. I'm Elaine Kutsukos, and I'm the coordinator of the Transportation Advisory Board. Also presenting is Joe Barbeau, Senior Transportation Planning Planner for the Council. We will start with an overview of the solicitation, the modal categories and criteria weighting, then follow this with the scoring process to get to the final project scores. The purpose of the regional solicitation is to distribute federal transportation program block STPG grant funds and congestion mitigation air quality, which we also call CMEC program funds, to projects that meet regional transportation needs using a transparent and technically driven scoring system to help select projects. The current regional solicitation is a result of a reevaluation and overhaul that occurred prior to the 2014 regional solicitation. Prior to 2014, the solicitation had awarded projects by funding source and categories roadway projects by functional class and currently awarded projects by mode and categories in current. OK. It currently awards projects by mode and categories and categorizes projects by project type within the modal categories. It currently awards projects by mode and categorizes projects by project type within modal categories. The funding is distributed to projects based on eligibility. For example, CMAC funds are assigned to eligible, eligible projects first, then STPB funds are awarded next. For this solicitation, bridge funds and carbon reduction funds will be assigned before the STPB funds. This figure shows your next slide. This figure shows the three modal funding categories and the application criteria in each mode. Each application is designed to select projects that meet a specific transportation need. Projects in each application category are scored against each other. At the top, there is also a unique projects category. This is the first year that an application was, re was recreated for this category. Tab and the Council established these evaluation criteria that criteria were designed to apply across all funding categories with some exceptions, specifically the Safe Houses School Transit Modernization and Travel Demand Management applications each have one criterion that is category specific. There are other criteria that are removed from individual categories. For example, bridge category does not need a congestion air quality score because projects tend to replace or reconstruct existing infrastructure. It, all categories were designed to add up to 1,000 points, and the cost effectiveness measure was added to each category in 2016. In 2014, TAB assigned weights to each of the criteria. Note that from category to category, the criteria were weighted differently. For example, congestion and air quality is weighted heavily in spot mobility and safety and TDM because it is very integral to what categories are meant to accomplish. Under bridges, infrastructure age is highly weighted and transit usage is weighted highest. Few changes have occurred in these weightings since 2014. Within each of the criteria, one or more scoring measures is included and assigned a number of points. These were prepared by the Funding and Programming Committee and the Technical Advisory Committee and approved by TAB. These examples show differences between categories. Fewer criteria are in transit expansion versus a transit traffic management technologies application. This leads to a 350 point criterion in the usage for transit. The equity and affordable housing criterion and measures are identical in the applications, except that the point value is doubled in transit expansion. Similarly, risk assessment is lower in transit expansion as roadway projects tend to carry more risk to complete than transit projects. Dealing with railroads, historic resources, and right of way can delay a project start. Each measure is scored independently within the application. Each application may score well in one measure and not another. Applications with more measures reduces the likelihood of a large point spread. This is a really good example why funding decisions should not hinge on comparing scores from one category to another. Each of the scoring measures informs applicants of the information needed in the application process. 
In this example, taken from the transit expansion application, the applicant simply needs to map their project. The map, the project mapping application will then provide the information needed to fill out the information in the four bullet points. However, last mile service can be awarded points, and that is to be explained in writing. Other measures request open-ended replies or data particular to the project. Each scoring measure includes scoring guidance that informs applicants on how to, the measure will be scored and instructs scores on how to score the project. Scoring guidance, along with the effort required by the scores, varies greatly from measure to measure. The example on the left is quantitative and the scores effort involves awarding full points to the top score and weighing the rest of the scores appropriately proportionally to the top score. The measures on the right is more open ended and the score will need to read each application and award points in a qualitative manner. In these cases, scores have a leeway on how they rate projects with most opting to create a scoring matrix to help build consistency and organize the responses. After applications are submitted, they are reviewed for federal eligibility and whether they applied in the correct category. The eligible applications are then forwarded to the scoring committees. I will now turn it over to Joe to discuss the scoring process. Thanks, Elaine. So uh, scoring committees are made up of technical committee men members, other local officials and council staff. Um, and we've been doing this for several regional solicitation cycles. Uh, they're designed to have a geographic and agency type variety. We also assign certain challenging measures to subject matter experts. For example, we have bridge specific uh, professionals assigned to certain bridge specific uh, scoring measures. And uh, the, the committees also provided with the professionals to discuss any interpretations or other challenges that come through during the scoring process. Um, so we have 11 traditional scoring categories that uh, were shown up on a table a few slides ago, and uh, we do not score unique projects and the ABRT uh, in this manner. But uh, in those 11, from those 11 categories, we have nine scoring committees. We do combine a couple of them. Transit expansion and modernization are combined uh, because they uh, have nearly identical measures for the most part, and then traffic management te technologies and roadway reconstruction and modernization are combined because traffic management technologies tends to get very few applications, and we are able to usually combine some scores on that one, though it does turn out to be a fairly big group. Um, each of the nine committees has a scoring committee chair who works with the scores as who works the scores as individuals and with the full committee to solve various challenges that occur in the process. So after the scoring is complete, each of the scores have done their their scoring. There's a meeting uh, to walk through each of the measures one by one. Um, scorers will call out any uh, ambiguities or inconsistencies or questions that they have, and the scoring committee collaborates to come up with a solution. Um, and then they produce a draft score sheet that you'll see on the next slide. The score sheet uh, looks like this. Uh, behind this, each of these individual measures, 1A, 1B, etc., has its own sheet that results in producing these scores, but these are the final, are the scores produced by each scorer for the measures. Um, after the committee agrees upon the scores and measures 1A through 6, in this example, council staff takes the total preliminary points, divides them by the total cost to produce cost effectiveness. That's measure 7CE there, and then a grand total is shown at the end. So um, this is as I say, draft preliminary scores, final scores uh, will look like this as well, possibly identical, but there is a process, uh, about a one month process uh, before that um, to appeal scores. So if any scores change from this point, uh, you might see slightly different numbers in the final scores. Um, you can go next. <clears throat> so applicants, uh, I just mentioned the scoring appeals, applicants have a chance to appeal their scores. The process is really meant to uncover errors. There have been times when maybe a math error has occurred, um, and a, a really obvious change is needed. Um, there are other times when applicants uh, have appealed, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, applicants have appealed uh, scores that are a little bit more qualitative, and that becomes a challenge for the scorer. Um, when an applicant reviews an appeal, the council staff will convene the score and the scoring committee chair. The score will review their process and determine whether they made an error or they missed something in the process and then uh, work with the chair to come in agreement with whether to 
change the score. So um, the appeals are brought to the subsequent funding and programming committee meeting where the chairs provide summaries. The uh, scores are not really directly a part of that, but the chairs provide the summary of what had happened and the decision, the recommendation that the chair and the score have come up with. Funding and programming will determine whether or not a scoring change is warranted and vote on it then and there. And that's really the end of the process. It doesn't go on to the next committees. Um, and then following that determination, a table like you saw on the previous slide is produced as the final score. For, um, and then we'll have 11 of those uh, that are um, <clears throat> being shown now as we uh, go through the process of making determinations of what to fund. So um, I mentioned unique projects earlier, and Lane might have did as well. And those do not go through that process. This is a uh, a, a, something that has been sort of part of the regional solicitation since at least the late 2000s. And historically, uh, the purpose of unique projects is to be able to fund projects that don't fit into the traditional categories. Um, we've, uh, we have funded our travel behavior inventory survey that way. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we were funding, we funded diesel engine retrofits. We funded some shared mobility services. And the focus is generally on innovation, environment, and multimodalism and equity. So um, the unique projects didn't really have a scoring process until this year. This year, uh, in the last solicitation, we set aside four and a half million dollars from this solicitation. Um, and the reason for that is because the turnaround on those projects and the funding process in those projects is a little bit quicker than our than our usual roadway type projects. Um, so right now, as we speak, uh, a committee of tab members is helping rate those projects. They are meeting next week to uh, do that. $4.5 million was set aside, and interestingly enough, that's roughly the amount that we had in applications, um, but TAB does not have to select every application. Because of that, they can select as many or as few of these projects as they would like. So that if there's any funding that isn't warranted, it will go into funding the 11 primary categories. So uh, project selection is kind of the process that we're in now. Um, TAB awards, uh, projects uh, based on the of course the funding availability um they need to stay within the modal ranges that you see here on this slide um and those modal ranges have remained fairly consistent over the past several cycles there was a small tweak to it one or two cycles ago so each funding category is shown to tab in descending order of the score um, and count and then council staff has produced sample or not sample starting point funding scenarios that award um, the correct amount of funding that's available to be award and awarded and then adhere to the other norms and rules of the process. Most projects towards the top of the category rankings will be funded under just about any circumstance you can imagine. Um, but the projects that are sort of at the margins are the projects that sort of could shift around who's funded and who isn't in. Uh, various scenarios. So within each of the three modes, um, so the staff's, staff created those funding scenarios sort of a, as a starting point within each of the three modes. Um, they, we put, um, we sort of used the number of applications as a proxy for how much demand there is. So for example, we had a lot of demand, a lot of applications in roadway reconstruction and modernization. So we tried to get a little bit far down that list, um, but we also consider other things like geographic distribution. Historically, we want to make sure we get a sizable project, at least one in each county, for example. And also um, where scoring gaps indicate maybe a drop in, in quality. For example, uh, if two projects are separated by, by one point, that's essentially a tie if they're separated by 100 points. There's a little bit more of a discernible gap, so sometimes you we use those to inform how we make those um, suggestions. So um, traditionally, funding has been awarded by TAB pretty close to the midpoint of these scenarios. If you look at these midpoints on the slide, 55.5 for roadways, 30% for transit, and 14.5 for bike ped. Um, though there's not a rule that it has to be at that midpoint, it has to be in the range. Um, so at, at this time, you have a, a um, traditional midpoint scenario. And there's also that bike pet heavy scenario that goes a little more towards the top of that bike pet range at the expense of um, a couple of roadway and transit projects. Okay. So um, there are a number of rules that help guide this process. Um, historically, TAB puts a lot of weight and stock in the scores. So it's nearly impossible to compare projects between categories uh, for some of the reasons Elaine got to. 
Um, there's just a lot of variables from category to category, so be very careful um, rating points here or even percentage of top points here versus in a different category. Um, but within categories, those those scores uh, become very valuable. So um, one consistent piece, one consistent thing that TAB has not done is sort of skipped a higher scoring project to get to a lower scoring project. There's not a rule against it, but it's it's a norm that TAB has um, effectively adopted over the past. Um, unless one of the other rules that are shown here uh, forces that to happen. So for example, um, in roadway, in all the roadway categories, at least one project from each roadway classification must be funded. Um, there was one cycle where we did skip a number of projects to get to that. Uh, we have a $10 million target towards the bridge category. We actually exceeded that this year because there was um, some new bridge money, um, but we do want to get to that point of at least $10 million under normal circumstances. In transit, we have a maximum $32 million for BRT projects. We install, installed that, um, I believe, last cycle uh, when we added the $25 million ABRT award. Um, and, and that was a measure to make sure that BRT doesn't dominate the entire transit category. Um, and then also in transit, uh, there's a rule that at least one new market project, which is a project that serves a little bit less traditional transit areas, has to be funded. And then um, two projects in the same category that are adjacent to each other cannot be funded. And the purpose of that is, you know, if I have a bike trail that's seven miles and I have a 3.5 here and a 3.5 here, uh, that could be a way around the project funding maximum. So I can apply for both of them, but I can only get one funded. So if if I do have two high scoring projects, one of them might be skipped. So that's an example, another example of why we might skip a project that is not applicable this year. Next. So um, we also have at the same time the Highway Safety Improvement Program or HSIP solicitation. So MnDOT um, op runs this process and they do it in each of their MnDOT districts. So this, this we are in the Metro District, which is our seven counties along with Chisago County. Um, so they this process funds smaller projects aimed at reducing high impact crashes. Uh, scoring, as I said, occurs at MnDOT. Those council staff and some of the technical committee members that participate with us uh, have participated as scorers in that process. TAB does approve the projects at the same time as it approves the regional solicitation projects. Um, and then applicants do submit to both programs, um, our regional solicitation and the HIP solicitation, but they can only receive funding for one of them. So if they score really well in both, they would have to make a choice. Um, and that choice is probably, if it's a lower cost project, they would probably choose HIP because that does fund at 90% as opposed to our 80%. Um, but if it's a higher cost project, they might choose our solicitation because uh, we do have higher maximum funding awards. And uh, with that, uh, we would be here for questions. I think that's wrap here. Let me um, stop recording.